Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Jean-Manuel Rubino. He is a Hi. professor of ancient history at Université Rennes II. He is a classics scholar who specializes in Greek antiquity, the historical anthropology of sport, and the history of social inequalities. And today we're focusing on his book, The Dangerous Life and Ideas of Diogenes the Cynic. So, Jean Manuel, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be there. So, just before we get into Diogenes himself, just to get a little bit of historical background, historical context to the period where he lived. So uh, back then, uh, t tell us about this idea about how, how apparently back then uh, many ancient Greek philosophers thought of philosophy as a way of life and why perhaps this is relevant for discussing uh, Diogenes philosophy. Yes, uh, you have different uh, uh, form of uh, Greek and Roman philosophies who are conceived as a uh, uh, ethic philosophy, meaning philosophy mm -hmm. of life, uh, philosophy yeah. which is providing a kind of uh, uh, moral compass, moral scheme uh, to uh, organize your choices and to decide what is wrong and what is right in life. And the, 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 maybe the beginning of this movement is uh, with Socrates and uh, Diogenes uh, is a pupil of Antisthenes, which is who is a pupil of uh, Socrates. So you have this kind of Greek tradition of uh, um, building um, uh, schools of thought, uh, which are uh, way of life, ways of life at the same time. And cynicism is uh, strongly based on this idea, the idea that you cannot be only uh, a philosopher producing ideas, but you have to uh, live them in your everyday life. So you cannot be only a scholar, you have to be a kind of agent of your philosophy. Mm -hmm. And what was basically the context of the wider Mediterranean world back in the 4th century BC, which is apparently when Diogenes lived? Yeah, he is born at the end of the 5th century BC uh, and he died during the 320s, mm -hmm. uh, around that. Um, so yeah, he is a man of the 4th century BC. Uh, it's a... Uh, uh, it's an opening world, uh, meaning that there is a kind of very dynamic international economy at the time and uh, lots of conflicts too uh, around the Aegean Sea. And uh, the, the thing is, we have what is interesting is uh, there are lots of foreigners moving from one city to the other and Diogenes was one of them because he uh, suffered from an exile, he had to exile from his uh, uh, city, uh, Sinop, uh, in, on the Black Sea, a Greek city, and uh, he is one of these uh, many uh, thousands foreigners going from one city to uh, another. And the first century BC is really a moment when we see uh, lots of foreigners uh, in different uh, cities. We don't, we cannot really observe that before. There were some foreigners at the fifth or the sixth century BC in the cities. Cities were not closed communities, but uh, maybe not so many. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's, that's the first uh, uh, thing. The second thing is you have at the same time uh, in the fourth century uh, you have very little cities, meaning uh, uh, with a uh, 1,000, 2,000 inhabitants, and you have also very large ones, uh, like uh, Syracuse, like uh, uh, Alexandria at the end of the 4th century, like Rhodes, uh, like Athens and Corinth. And Athens and Corinth were two of the largest cities of the time, and uh, Diogenes uh, chose to live um, alternately in each of them. He was living uh, during the during the, um, the winter in Athens and during the summer in, in, in Corinth. So he was living in very large city, which are a very specific kind of uh, city, city with a lot of um, different nationalities, people from all over the mm -hmm. Mediterranean world. So uh, tell us a little bit about perhaps what were some of the main events in the life of Diogenes that you think really 
played the biggest role in shaping his philosophy? Because, I mean, I know that he was exiled at a certain point and then he lived, as you mentioned, there in different cities. So tell us a little bit about why, why that happened and why he basically had to be moving between different cities, because I guess that then later on plays a role in aspects of his way of thinking and philosophy. Yes, um, yeah, he is, he is an exile, so he, he has to uh, flee from his city um, for a very specific reason. He was involved with his father uh, in a kind of a, a money counterfeiting um, affair case and uh, he had to go away uh, to avoid uh, prison or even uh, execution so uh, he left his city we don't know exactly when but it, it could be in the 360s uh, around that uh, that he had to leave the uh, the city and i think his exile um, in the fourth century bc doesn't mean uh, the same maybe or maybe it means the same as today it's a very hard uh, experiment uh, of life it's uh, considered by ancient people as the kind of uh, ultimate uh, detachment uh, ultimate loss uh, because when i was talking about lots of foreigners in the 400th century world most of them were coming back on a regular basis to their city their original cities they were just uh, moving from one to the other doing some uh, trade but they were coming back to their city and then you have exiles and uh, exile is a very um, complicated uh, uh, thing because then it means you lose your complete social environment you lose the ability to get buried when you die in your the, the earth the ground of your motherland uh, which means a lot to an ancient greek of the of the time so uh, this this is the first really traumatic experience of diogenes uh, life and um, this is the beginning in fact of his philosophical career we don't know if uh, two months six months two years five years uh, happen before uh, be or between the exile and the beginning of the philosophical life but we know that there is a kind of very strong link between the two um, episodes uh, the thing is uh, when you lose attached to, to your to your city uh, you lose your your main uh, belonging you are supposed in a greek world you're supposed to belong to your family to your uh, neighborhood to your village to your city mainly and then you you are apart from this uh, belonging and this kind of uh, experience of uh, detachment uh, had a strong effect on uh, um, the way uh, Diogenes conceived his philosophy because cynicism is a philosophy of detachment you are you are supposed to refuse uh, every kind of belonging. You're not supposed to get married. You're not supposed to build a family. Uh, family is a cultural construct. City is a cultural construct. So uh, there is a there is a clear link between the experience of exile and the um, the way Diogenes shaped uh, cynicism philosophy, cynic philosophy. So this is one of the main ways he got into the idea of cosmopolit cosmopolitanism. Right. Yeah, this is one of the roots. Uh, there is maybe a second uh, context uh, uh, element, which is Sinop is a uh, original city, is a native uh, city, is a city on the uh, south shore of the Black Sea, uh, meaning uh, north of Asia Minor. Uh, and there, here at the time, there are lots of um, barbarian uh, ethnies. Many of them were in the Persian Empire and were, which are in contact with uh, Sinop or threatening uh, Sinop and the other Greek cities of the Black Sea. Meaning that very early Diogenes had a personal uh, experience of the relationship with uh, other culture, other ethnic, non-Greek uh, people. Uh, so, so the, the cosmopolitanism, which is uh, which is credited of the invention, um, the cosmopolitanism uh, is at the same time can be understood as a, as a, a consequence of his exile and at the same time uh, of his experience of uh, barbarian uh, ethnic and conflicts in Asia Minor. Yes.
Mm -hmm. And by the way, back then, because uh, in the kind of world we live in nowadays, things work, I guess, very differently. But back then, moving, for example, between cities and between states, uh, I mean, how hard or easy was it? Because, I mean, I imagine that back then people didn't have really documentation and I, but then when it came to for example the social and political status of an exile or someone who was not considered a citizen i mean how did it work back then i, I would imagine it would b vary between for example city states in greece how would they deal with those kinds of people but uh, how was it back then Do, yeah. uh, living that way Yes, yes. There are different situations. Every city is a kind of it's a city state, so it's a kind of very little nation, if you want. Yeah. So, so, so uh, you have a body of citizens. They are the one who, with the power, the political power, uh, and the, the um, uh, judiciary power. So they they go they they are working in court. They are working in the assembly, in the councils, etc. Yeah. Then you have foreigners. So if you are in exile. Uh, the normal situation, if you are free, if you're not a slave, the normal situation is, is, is that you will be a resident foreigner. Uh, then in some very specific situations, some cities, including Athens, um, build some uh, like exclusive personal status from uh, for exiles coming from a city that is a kind of ally city. So when you have a civil war in an ally city and when the democratic people are exiled from their city, it has happened in the 5th and the 4th century BC that Athens built some very um, um, uh, exclusive with some privileged uh, personal status for this group of exiles. But this didn't happen to Diogenes when he arrived in Athens or in Corinth. He was only just a kind of resident foreigner. So you have to register. Uh, and you have to pay taxes as a resident foreigner, uh, which is very important. It's not very expensive, but it's uh, very important because if you don't, you are suspected to try to pretend you're a citizen. If you don't pay the foreigner tax, then you are you can suffer a trial, and there are some heavy risk uh, with that coming. So uh, the the situation where you are uh, uh, moving from one city to the other if, is that you will be a uh, if you are there for some days or some weeks, you will be a, like a provisory foreigner and then there is no administration, uh, but you have no rights either, meaning that if you are threatened, beaten, stolen, you have no way to defend yourself in court. Uh, but then when you are a resident foreigner, then you have a kind of uh, protection from the city. But you have no political right, no judiciary right, meaning you, you cannot... Uh, you cannot vote in a court, you cannot vote in an assembly, you cannot be a magistrate. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation for free people, of course. For If you are suspected to be a slave, then the situation is even different. And by the way, Diogenes himself was a slave for a little while, right? Yes, uh, during the 340s, he's been abducted by a pirate, which was a very not not common but uh, not unusual uh, event there are lots of pirates in the uh, aegean and mediterranean sea at the time and even alexander the great had to uh, to fight uh, against pirates around crete for some times uh, and uh, yes uh, so the pirates were uh, attacking villages they were abducting people and then uh, two ways first way is they were asking for a ransom and they were giving back the people they had abducted if they got the ransom, first situation. Second situation, they were um, going away from the place where they did the abduction and selling everyone on a market slave. That's what happened to Diogenes. He's been, uh, he's been sold to a Corinthian uh, man, Xeniades, and uh, after some years, he's been released, freed, and franchised. Mm -hmm. So yes, he, he had an exper a personal experience of uh, uh, slavery. He's not the only philosopher who had that experience, but he's one, he's one of them. And lots of people had this experience and this fear to be abducted by pirates. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, of course, I imagine that he was exposed to a different uh, culture. So was he a cultural relativist in any way? 
Yes, uh, yeah, in a way you could, you could say that. He, he, he had the idea that lots of uh, things in everyday social life were uh, culturally, culturally built. So mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, looking at most of social conventions as convention on social customs as customs, meaning for Diogenes, marriage was a cultural uh, custom. Family was a cultural uh, custom. Wealth mm -hmm. was a cultural custom. So in a way, uh, when you develop this kind of uh, um, philosophy, you, you could say you are a cultural relativist, meaning that you, but the thing is, was, he was not interested in comparing culture. Mm -hmm was interesting and uh, in opposing culture on nature. Okay. Yeah, and basically I guess that through his life experiences it became easier for him to basically question uh, norms. Right? Yeah. He spent most of his life doing that absolutely <laughs> doing trying to uh, to unbuild uh, uh, norms and to to con not uh, not always to contest them but to mm -hmm. question them. To, to make people understand that they were only customs, norms, and they were not uh, facts uh, by nature. So uh, it, was a, it is a, a big part of uh, uh, cynicism uh, that the, to, to, to point at uh, culturally built uh, ways of life. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book, you also talk about how one of his ideas was about attacking uh, power, glory, and the, obs the obsession some people had with social status. Could you tell us about that? Uh, attack, you said glory and obsession of social status? Uh, the obsession with social yeah. status, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, for Diogenes, uh, uh, there are important matters, mm -hmm. philosophical mm -hmm. ones, and there are superficial matters. And uh, uh, to search for power, uh, is a, it's a kind of super, superficial activity to search for glory if you're an athlete or a political um, um, leader or a military leader is a, is a superficial one and to search for a better status too meaning that uh, for Diogenes if you are a slave you don't need to search uh, for freedom if you are a foreigner you don't need to search for citizenship if you are a citizen you don't need to search for uh, kind of better political position in your city. All of these are uh, superficial goals. They are not helping you uh, in a philosophical way to uh, behave uh, better uh, without um, pursuing uh, artificial uh, goals. So uh, one of the parts of cynicism was to point at those um, artificials, uh, artificial goals and uh, mm -hmm intentions. You are supposed to go back to what is essential, what is necessary, needs, uh, not nothing uh, uh, extravagant. And the uh, power is considered as a kind of uh, useless uh, goal and glory too. At, uh, athletes are attacked on a regular basis because they are, uh, to Diogenes' eyes, focused uh, on uh, the search of glory instead of being focused on the search of uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. And of course, he ended up living in poverty most of his life. And in the book, you talk about how he distinguished between the fact of poverty and the feeling of poverty. So what's the distinction there? Yes, so it's a, the distinction is a very popular in the philosophical field of the end of the 5th century and the beginning mm -hmm. of the 4th century. So yeah. uh, Eugenius is like a, a, um, um, appropriating an idea that, that has always been, uh, that, has, that has been, I'm sorry, that has been formulated before him by Socrates, by uh, uh, Antisthenes, by Xenophon. So it's a very popular idea, uh, which is the distinction between um, the fact of poverty and the feeling of poverty, meaning uh, in Diogenes' point of view, you have to make a distinction between people who are uh, like uh, really poor because they have absolutely nothing to live and survive, and people uh, who feel poor because there are more needs than they have means. Meaning that mm -hmm. you can be uh, extremely wealthy, you can be one of the wealthiest men of your city, but if you have uh, piled 
lots of obligations, uh, financial ones, personal ones. Maybe uh, you are in difficulty to face all these obligations. So uh, the, the idea is that you have to, to see if someone is rich or poor. You have to look at what he needs on a regular basis. So yeah, does he have a frugal life or not? And what are his means? And if, even if you have big means, if you have bigger needs, because you are organizing banquets for your friends all the time, because you are financing very expensive um, programs in the city, etc., maybe you will suffer from a feeling of poverty, even if not, if on the paper you're not poor, at all. So that's a kind of very interesting distinction because it's it's been um, uh, it's still in use in uh, contemporary mm -hmm. sociology the distinction between fact and feeling of poverty and it came from uh, those from the Socratic school in fact Socrates, Antisthenes, Xenophon and uh, Diogenes. So yes, it, uh, and this is linked with um, this question. In fact, is linked with a. Um, a kind of revolution in the intellectual world of the four, fifth, fourth century BC, which is the birth of the idea of economy. Um, at the end of the fifth century and the beginning of the fourth, so around 400 uh, yeah. BC, we have a, a series of new words, words uh, in the Greek lexicon, who are ap appearing in the language, mm -hmm. uh, meaning uh, oikonomos, uh, oikonomeo, oikonomikos, oikonomia. Oikonomia with gave, that gave birth to our economy. Uh, oikonomos, uh, which means someone, which means a manager of his household. Uh, oikonomikos, which means uh, someone uh, who has some qualities in management <laughs> in his private household. Uh, what I'm trying to tell is at the end of the 5th and beginning of the 1st century, there are some new words to describe a reality which is new to Greek eyes at the time, which is uh, uh, economic management. Before that, nobody has ever developed a kind of uh, thought about this uh, economic world. And suddenly, uh, it appears to Greeks that this is, it is something you have to understand. And uh, of course, as it's the same time when you have a new discipline appearing, there is no economist at the time. So all um, the people who are thinking about this new economy are philosoph philosophers. So every uh, uh, philosophical school of the time uh, has produced some economic treaties about this question of management, what it is to uh, to be rich, to be poor, what it, how do you uh, organize your household, or how do you manage your slave, how do you choose your wife, etc., which are considered as economic questions. Mm -hmm. And related to his, uh, to Diogenes economic, economic ideas, there's also this idea of his criticizing a system governing the accumulation and distribution of wealth, right? Yes, absolutely, in different ways. Uh, in Diogenes' eyes, money, coins, mm -hmm. are a cultural construct. They are useless, so we shouldn't need coins to, to trade, for example. So that's maybe the first level. But the second level is that wealth is not a goal. You, you, you shouldn't try to get richer because it's useless. You should do the opposite. You should try to feel rich by um, decreasing your, your needs. So in the relationship between means and needs, uh, he says, okay, people are focused on increasing their means. They shouldn't. They should be focused on decreasing their needs. And this is cynic uh, way of life. You are supposed to live a very simple, very frugal, very autarchic, autarchic uh, life. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yes, that's, that's the idea. That's uh, wealth and the, the field of wealth and patrimony and owning uh, is uh, something you have to fight against. This is useless. And this is even more useless in Diogenes' eyes because you're not supposed to build a family on the dynasty. So uh, in Greeks' eyes, you are supposed to build wealth, patrimony, household, because you want to give it to your heirs. So this is a family matter. You are supposed to, to transfer, to provide, to increase the family wealth and to give it to the next generation. 
and Diogenes says we don't need to make kids and, and we don't need to uh, transfer there any kind of wealth. So everything is linked in a way. The, the, the need for family and the need for the search of wealth are both uh, contested in cynic point of view. And related to the distribution of wealth, did he care about economic inequality, for example? No, uh, you couldn't say that really. Uh, there is no uh, uh, social conscience in uh, cynicism okay. in a way we could say that in a, in a, in a modern world. Uh, the, for, for Diogenes, this is an individual question. There is not really like a social categories uh, that we have to improve the situation. Uh, the, the way to improve your situation is to live a philosophical life. So it's not a um, social aid won't help you. Uh, anyway, social aid in the Greek city is a very, very tiny uh, uh, matter for everyone. But uh, apart from that, in Diogenes' uh, point of view, like you said, with the fact of poverty and the feeling of poverty, that's what you have to deal with is this uh, ability to feel rich. And this is a very individual matter. You have to face it by yourself. So as long as you don't, again, for for cynics, you you are not supposed to belong to any kind of category, including social category. Mm -hmm. And of course, he was also a mendicant philosopher. He practiced mendicancy. And back then, how did uh, Greeks look at that way of living? I mean, was that also a sort of a violation of some norms in Greek society. Yeah, it, it, you could say that. Yes, uh, it's uh, um, for a Greek of the first century. A beggar is a parasite, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, he is considered as a parasite because the main um, uh, the main social value in the relationship is, is what they called philia, which is a known. Uh, philosophical concept, we, uh, we often uh, translate it by friendship, but the, the closest translation would be, would be reciprocity. Uh, so uh, uh, what does it mean? It means that you are in a world where there is no social security, there is no insurance, meaning that the level of protection on, on security and safe, social safety you can get is heavily linked with the number of, of um, reciprocal relationship you build with people, with your friends, with your family, with your neighbors, with uh, the citizens of your city. So uh, you build relationship. What does it mean On, in everyday life? It means that if you have a sacrifice, you sacrifice an animal because you have, you are uh, organizing the wedding of your daughter for example, uh, then if you don't invite your neighbor, you will come to your neighbor and you will give your neighbor a piece of the sacrifice because maybe in two months, in three months, you will have a problem, you will be on your field and you will break a tool and you will need your neighbor to, to borrow uh, a tool. So uh, um, that's, that's the way Greeks understand social life. You are, you are giving to people and they are giving to you when you need something. So it works in the family, it works with friends, it, it works with neighbors. The thing is, uh, um, beggars, they, don't, they are not part of that uh, like virtuous circle. They are away from that because they never give anything basically they only ask for arms so uh, they are considered as a um, lost causes if you want there is a, a, a greek proverb saying something like uh, uh, not even a, um, not even a beggar's parents are his friends uh, so, so meaning that you if you are a beggar you are alone you are by yourself uh, so they are the, the, the basic conception of uh, mendicancy is that uh, beggars are parasites. And then cynics come and they change the, the, the pattern. They say uh, that, of course, they ask for something, they ask for arms, but in exchange, they provide philosophy. They provide advice, they provide wisdom, they provide uh, clarity of thinking, etc. So they are giving something in return. And th there is a Greek word to say, to ask for alms, uh, aitain, and there is a, a Greek word to say, uh, to give something in return, apaitain, meaning that in the 
in the Greek conception, in the cynic conception, I mean, uh, the fact of begging is not a parasite attitude. It's a kind of give and take attitude. So that is what is really new with uh, um, uh, cynic uh, philosophy. It is um, giving birth to the, the idea that a beggar, uh, the life of begging can be a life of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And by the way, of course, we tend to associate Diogenes very much with with this jar. I mean, many times people talk about it as being a barrel and not a jar. We can get into that. But why is the jar so important as a sort of symbol of his life? Why do people associate him so much with the jar? Um, big, first, it's a symbol. First, it's a symbol uh, of uh, um, of uh, frugality, of uh, life, of uh, uh, economy. A, a very uh, uh, autarcic life, a very simple uh, life. So that's first, that's a symbol. But the thing is, in real life, that's the way it could be for some people. Some people were living in empty graves, in cabins, in huts, in tents and in jars. And we know that from uh, uh, the fifth century during the Peloponnesian War, we have some uh, a text, mainly a text from Thucydides, the historian, the main historian of the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and he's explaining and he's giving details about the way um, Athenian people had to live when they took refuge inside the walls of the city in 431 and we have, we have information about these uh, temporary uh, shelters temporary uh, accommodations and it is empty graves it is uh, tents and it is jars they use jars because those jars are what greek called pitoi are very large very high uh, ceramic jars, it can be more than two meters high. We still have some some of them, uh, thanks to the archaeology uh, of it, and uh, uh, they can be very high. They were used to store food, to store uh, uh, grain, cereals, uh, uh, and different kind of uh, different kind of, uh, of food. And most of the time, they were uh, put inside the the ground, like. Uh, uh, they were, you had to dig to put them, mm -hmm. uh, half of them in the ground to uh, to make them stable. But then you could use them in a um, crisis situation to live in it. So, and that's what Diogenes did in Athens, in the in the edges of the agora, uh, in the metro uh, sanctuary. He had a jar, and he decided to live to live there. No, we have no idea how the jar arrived there, but it must have been a jar from the sanctuary. And then it was empty and uh, someone maybe cleaned it, maybe not. Uh, anyway, he, he used it uh, to, to live there for, for some time. So it's not a tale or a legend. It's a, uh, it's a normal um, uh, crisis uh, uh, housing. Uh, in certain uh, in certain context. So when uh, when Diogenes in the 360s, 350s did that in Athens, lots of Athenians uh, had already seen some people living in this kind of jar. So this is no surprise uh, for them. This is not a kind of abnormal way of living. It's not usual on the Agora, but it's not totally uh, unique or crazy. And then uh, the story has uh, changed in Roman times when uh, Latin philosophers and Latin writers began to tell Diogenes' story in Latin. And they had to translate from Pitos, the Greek word to say jar, to a kind of uh, Latin equivalent. And they used uh, dolium, mainly, uh, which is a way to say barrel, uh, a cask, wooden cask and uh, but when they did that translation they knew they were uh, um, they knew that the original word was meaning ceramic jar they were just adjusting to their uh, lexicon uh, but then after that the memory of that get, got lost in the way and after during some centuries we've been uh, describing painting showing telling that Diogenes lived in a barrel so we have lots of uh, modern paintings for example with uh, Diogenes in um, in a barrel and uh, lots of books talking about Diogenes barrel which is a, a pure for the, this is a pure legend because when Diogenes 
was alive in the first century BC, there was no wooden barrel <laughs> on earth. The, the first uh, cask, um, the first barrels uh, to store wine uh, appeared, uh, we have some archaeological data and we have some text, appeared uh, during the first century BC. So uh, basically 300 years after Diogenes' life. So he has never lived in a barrel in Athens. He lived in a jar. And this jar is, a, uh, is a, at the same time a kind of um, is reflecting the place of the, the role of ceramic stuff in everyday life. There is lots of ceramic uh, vessel in, a, in a, um, everyday life in Athens at the time. There is a huge uh, ceramic uh, production area in the north of, uh, of Athens called Keramikos. Mm -hmm. And of course, as a foreigner and a mendicant philosopher, uh, back then, of course, he had very low social status. But I guess that a class of people that probably were even lower in social status than him were the slaves. And so, because we've already mentioned here that he was a slave in himself for a while, what ideas did he have about slaves? I mean, how did he think about them? Did he think that they were like uh, other common citizens, they, they were the same as other people or not? Yeah, the, the, uh, to Diogenes' mind, it is status is irrelevant in a way. So you are as free as you want to be, whatever is your status. So there is no like a political claim uh, mm -hmm. against, against slavery. Uh, but the, the idea is that you, um, what is interesting, uh, Diogenes, is less slavery than dependence. You are, um, you are free if you do not depend, if you don't depend of any kind of uh, uh, specific uh, need. So you have to, to build uh, the strongest autonomy you can, the strongest freedom, and this you can do inside a slave life. So the fact that you are a slave doesn't mean that you cannot live a philosophical life in Diogenes' uh, point of view. So uh, slavery in a way is not a very um, important matter in a way that uh, cynics use it mainly as a model, as a metaphorical model to dependence. You are, the point is to try not to be depend of, uh, dependent of anything. Meaning that if you are a master, and if you own many slaves, but if your full life depends on your slave, if you are unable to do anything by yourself, and if you have a level of comfort that is uh, strongly based on the way you own slave, you are in fact more a slave than your slaves. Mm -hmm. So so in, a, in Diogenes' point of view, again, it's a question of, uh, we would say today, a per personal development. Uh, you, you have to be able to, uh, to build uh, a kind of space of freedom in your life, whatever is your status. Of course, if you have a free status, it will be easier, but uh, it will come with more obligations sometimes, so maybe it will be more difficult in a way. So uh, when you say that uh, slaves are even a uh, harder situation than uh, um, foreigners, in fact, with uh, beggars, we, we could ask the question, because in a way, slaves, mm -hmm. they, have some, uh, they have some reciprocal relationship with the master, with all the slaves, so okay. they, they, can, they can have kind of uh, some protections in a way that beggars won't get from anyone. So, so sometimes a uh, slave has had a, a better life than beggars, or may, maybe a more protected one even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, per perhaps I was thinking more about a sort of modern point of view where being a slave would be worse than being a beggar, because at least the beggar would have more freedom. Let's yeah, yeah, but you're, on paper, you're absolutely right. On paper, the, the worst status is to be a slave. But the thing is, in everyday life, some slaves mm -hmm. have uh, money, have a comfort, comfortable life, and can be protected. Meaning, if they have a value to their master, and if they are molested by someone, the master will prosecute injustice for them. So, uh, uh, which that this is something that nobody will do for a beggar. So, so, uh, so um, that's a complex situation. That's a complex situation. Mm -hmm. 
So getting into other aspects of Diogenes' philosophy, is pleasure a legitimate desire for Diogenes and the cynics more generally? Um, all the cynics didn't have the same uh, okay. opinion about that. Antisthenes, uh, with a kind of master of Diogenes, um, Antisthenes was refusing pleasure, at least okay. uh, as far as we can understand Antisthenes philosophical proposal. So, uh, which uh, Diogenes didn't do uh, part of life. Uh, so, uh, cynic philosophy with Diogenes and after Diogenes is not a, um, a refusal of pleasure philosophy. Um, the thing is, again, is the question of uh, autonomy and dependence. Pleasure is a problem if you are dependent of a pleasure. You can drink some wine. But if you need to drink wine every okay. uh, every week or at every banquet, there is a problem. You can have a sexual life, but uh, if you are addicted to it, it's a problem. You can you have the right to love food and to enjoy a good piece of bread and nice olive oil. It's no problem with that. But e again, if you cannot live without it, then it's a problem. So pleasure is not in self. Um, uh, as no moral issue or ethical issue in itself. The question is uh, if you are dependent of one or other kind of pleasure. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and how did they think about other animals? Did they see, did they look in any way at other animals as a possible model for human conduct, at least to some extent? Yes. Uh, yeah, the the, the um, animals are a model to uh, to cynics, uh, meaning that uh, they have an ability uh, to uh, simplicity, to autarky, to uh, frugality, which is much bigger than men. So, in the cynic point of view, you have gods on the top, mm -hmm. you have animals in the middle, and you have men in the bottom. So that's the cynic hierarchy of the. Uh, world in a way and then you have um, uh, wise uh, men philosophers that sometimes uh, can uh, be higher than the animals but lower than the gods like in between but uh, for normal um, animals are supposed to be a model first because they live a life of simplicity they don't have so many needs uh, and they adjust uh, their uh, needs to their means um, so they live a life of, of frugality and then some specific animals in the scenic point of view like dogs will have some uh, uh, qualities uh, uh, that should be inspiring uh, dogs are loyal uh, they are honest uh, they uh, again they live a simple very simple life so you can give them a bone and they will be very happy with that. So uh, the, the idea is that uh, the animal world and some of the animals specifically uh, can be used as a model for, for human conduct, yes. Mm -hmm. And related to some other, let's say, norms in Greek society, of course, we've already talked a little bit here about marriage, for example, but what were his views exactly about things like marriage, pederasty, and prostitution? Um, so marriage is a cultural construct in a cynic point of view. So you are uh, you are not supposed to try to get married. So we have one exception. Uh, uh, one of Diogenes' pupils, Crates, who got married with Hipparchia, but it was a very strange marriage, was basically unbuilding every rule of uh, marriage. So it's not very a classical uh, marriage, you could say. So uh, marriage is a social uh, convention. Uh, pederasty, is, it's a... Very common practice in Athens in 4th century BC, meaning that uh, uh, for, me for most of men, adult men, I mean, free men, a citizen or foreigner, but free men, uh, it was normal to, um, you had like basically two sexual options on the table, if I could say that, um, women 
and boys. When I say boys, I mean uh, boys uh, which are not adult yet. So let's say 10 to 20 boys, if you want, 20 years boys. Mm -hmm. um, so th this was considered as a kind of two equal uh, possibility to uh, to live a sexual life. And you, lots of men were living the, both possibilities in parallel. Uh, so this is a very common way. Uh, um, to to do things, uh, but we have no uh, not a single detail about any pederastic relationship of Diogenes. The only anecdotes we have around that are presenting him as a kind of protector of kids, uh, not someone who was uh, using them using them for pleasure, or not someone who was using pederasty as a way to educate kids, because that's, what, that's the way Greeks were describing this social practice, a way to um, get boys to become uh, citizens, adults, through a personal, intimate and intellectual relationship. Uh, so, uh, to, so no marriage, basically, no pederasty, and uh, with prostitution, uh, you asked, uh, we know that he had a personal relationship with an Athenian uh, prostitute, but not, uh, um, not a relationship involving money, so it was not, as far as we know, it was not a commercial, a trade uh, relationship, it was a kind of uh, love uh, uh, normal, intimate, personal uh, relationship. So, uh, um, but again, with prostitution uh, in Diogenes' uh, conception, apart from his personal life, the, the question is the level of dependence. So he was making fun of people who were going on a regular basis to see prostitutes because in Diogenes' eyes and in Cynic's eyes, this was a red flag. It meant that you were, you were dependent of it, of this kind of pleasure. And this was a problem in a philosophical point of view. If you cannot live without it, then you have to uh, to face the philosophical issue it is. Mm -hmm. And what were his views on athletic competition, exercise and health? Um, so, so maybe there are two parts. Uh, okay. the, 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 the exercise, uh, is uh, good in a cynic point of view. You are supposed to uh, exercise your body because your body is the main tool of your f everyday philosophy. So mm -hmm. you are supposed to be uh, to try to be in good shape, to uh, to strengthen your 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 body, to train it. Uh, and Diogenes was known to um, even to twist some athletic exercises like. Uh, uh, what you would say, I am not sure what is the English word to say that, the, like there was some uh, gym, gymnastic uh, exercises with statue, like statue grabbing, you were working with statue, with positions, with statues that were in the gymnasium, and uh, instead of using it for wrestling techniques, to, to train some wrestling techniques and attitudes, uh, Diogenes was using these statues when they were uh, covered with snow in winter, to grab them and to uh, um, train to resist to the cold. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's a good anecdote because it's uh, showing that at the same time, to exercise your, your body, to strengthen your body was important, but it was not to, uh, uh, to prepare to some competition or to uh, improve in some very specific uh, technical uh, sport. And that's why I was saying that there are like two parts to, to the answer. The first thing is health is important because the body has to be strong to help the philosophy. But then sport, athletes, competition, that's something Diogenes has a very uh, strong uh, and uh, unfavorable uh, opinion because uh, competition, again, is um, a frame to search for glory. So uh, athletes are focused on the search for glory, uh, which is a problem in a philosophical view. We, we talked about it. And the, the second is they are uh, so focused on that that they are only training their body and they are not um, having a kind of uh, um, intellectual uh, development of education in parallel. So in Diogenes' point of view, uh, the problem with athletics is at the same time the obsession for victory and the, the fact that you neglect to develop your mind and not only your, 
your, your body. So the, the view on uh, exercise is positive, but the view on athletics is negative. Mm -hmm. And of course, another interesting thing about Diogenes is that he was all about speaking one's mind freely, and sometimes that would entail insulting, reprimanding, sarcasm. So t tell us about that. Um, yeah, that's one of the um, maybe most interesting part of the philosophy. Uh, uh, cynics are, in a way, um, they, they, they consider they have, have a kind of mission, you could say. So they are trying to uh, get more people come to philosophy, philosophical ideas, philosophical attitude, and, and life. So you have to go to people and to uh, provide some philosophical experience by talking with them, uh, by dialogue, etc. Uh, including insult, including uh, sarcasm, every way is good to, uh, to, um, to force people to philosophy. So the, that's, that's really a kind of philosophy with uh, no holds barred in a way that you, 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 you uh, cynic philosophers consider they have the right to do everything if it helps philosophy of if it helps someone to come to philosophy. So they will use every means to provoke philosophical conversation, philosophical uh, situation. The, the key principle is uh, what the Greek called paresia, meaning meaning uh, uh, freedom of speech, speaking freely, speaking tersely, uh, uh, speaking with no um, specific courtesy of any kind, uh, because courtesy is a social convention, and what you have to do is to force people to understand they are not living a life of philosophy and to try to convince them to to try to live a philosophical life. So yes, that is a, a, one of the main tools of uh, cynics when they try to convince other people to come to philosophy is uh, freedom of speech, paresia, uh, so a, a very ag sometimes a very aggressive way to, uh, to get in contact with people. And do you think that his defense of speaking one's mind and being honest relates in any way with his hate toward demagogues and populists? Yes, you, you could say that. You could say that uh, um, the thing is uh, populist uh, in uh, uh, political life of uh, cities, big cities or little cities, but mainly big cities like Athens. Um, there are people who are trying to get some political power um, and who are ready to say whatever citizens uh, want to hear. So uh, the main uh, tool of a populist is to lie, uh, to lie, to get uh, the power you want to get to to be able to uh, decide of some uh, of the political lines of the community. So uh, at the same time they are lying, which is uh, in a, a cynic point of view uh, not an appropriate way of behaving. And at the same time they are pursuing an artificial goal, which is power. Uh, so they behave dishonestly and they search for uh, something which is uh, in fact useless. So for these two reasons, uh, you, you could say that the, um, to speak one's mind is in contradiction with the populist uh, model. So the cynic way of speaking one's mind is uh, in contradiction with the, with the populist and demagogue model, yes. And, and there are certain very curious supposed episodes in Diogenes' life, like, for example, his supposed encounter with Alexander the Great that people disseminate a lot, but we are actually not sure if that really happened, right? Uh, yeah, we cannot be sure. The thing is, the, the question is, do we have reason to believe it happened? That's, yeah. that's the main question we could we could ask. Yes, uh, and uh, yes, we have reason to believe they met. Uh, first, Alexander had a strong interest uh, to philosophers. He's been educated partly by Aristotle, and he made several he met sorry several philosophers through his life. Uh, for example, Crates when he when he was in Teb, uh, etc. And uh, so, uh, if Alexander had an opportunity to meet Diogenes, there is no reason to doubt that they didn't meet. And the thing is, they had 
some opportunities, mainly during the 300, uh, 300, in 338, when Diogenes was involved in the Keronea battle, in which Alexander was involved too. Uh, and in 336, two years later, uh, Diogenes was during a part of the year in Athens, during the other part of the year in Corinth, and Alexander went during that year in those two cities, and even twice in Corinth during that year. So, yes, to answer your question, clearly, we cannot be sure. But we have uh, many good reasons. Uh, uh, Alexander would have been interested to meet Diogenes. He had several opportunities to do it. And we have text describing the, uh, the encounter. Of course, the, the, the texts are describing the encounter in a very legendified way. So, so uh, behind your question, I think that's, that's what you mean. Is, is there a part of legend in here? And yes, there, yeah. there is. Uh, there must be a part of legend in it. And the legend goes quite far because the legend tells us that they died the same day. Uh, so they are supposed to have died uh, the same day. We know exactly when uh, Alexander died during the night of the 10th to the 11th of June, 323. We have no clue for Diogenes. We have some reason to believe he's dead during the 320s. Maybe in 323, this is possible, but we have no detail. And clearly, this detail, the idea that they, are, they died the, at the exact same day, this is a part of the legend. Greeks love this kind of uh, synchronic events or alleged synchronic events. So there are some parts that are completely probable and some parts that are um, likely legends. But, but when Diogenes died, I mean, as at least as far as we know, he must have been in his uh, like early 80s or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have we don't know. Ex we have different information about the date of birth, so I wouldn't uh, give a precise age, but we know he was around 80, a bit more than uh, 80. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's difficult to be more. Uh, uh, more precise here because we don't know when he died and we don't know when he's born so <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, and by the way when it comes to his death how did he die and in this particular case what does it matter uh, the, the way a philosopher dies does it matter and why yes so so for the first part of your question we have uh, several um, versions of his death with different different dates and different context. So uh, for the way he died, we have at least four different versions. One saying that he died of eating a raw octopus, <laughs> uh, trying to demonstrate that cooking was useless. Um, why, one that he died of an infection after being beaten by dogs, uh, with which he was disputing a piece of octopus. Uh, one telling us that he died of self-suffocation uh, on the Craneion in Corinth, on the hill of the Craneion in Corinth with his own cloak. Um, one telling us that he died of fever. So, of course, he cannot, um, he, he cannot have been uh, killed by these four <laughs> reasons. So most of them are wrong, maybe all of them, which is likely uh, he might have just died of uh, age. Uh, he was a very old man, and uh, so we have we have no clue. But the thing is, why do we have so many legends? Because exactly that's the question you ask. Uh, is, is there a, a physical way of dying? And this is these legends are a way to express the idea that there is a philosophical way of uh, of dying. In ancient times, the death of a philosopher is um, supposed to be uh, the the last uh, demonstration of his philosophy. So uh, we have lots of anecdotes, biographical anecdotes about philosophers, showing that they were um, uh, either very close to their philosophy when they die, when they died, or on the contrary, extremely far from their philosophy, or in contradiction with their philosophy when they when they died. So there is a, a very uh, there is a huge interest in the scientific uh, ancient world about the death of uh, philosophers because again this is this idea that philosophy uh, can be um, demonstrated through your actions and your death is in a way the last even it's the last even of your life. Did you live it in a philosophical way? 
or did you not? And uh, Diogenes is not an exception. The legends around his life are, in a way, exploring the idea of did he, did he live a scenic death or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th there's also that uh, tale. I, I, I would call it a tale because I'm not 100% sure if it's true or not, but about Epicurus, where, I mean, because of the way he thought about death and how we shouldn't fear death, that uh, he apparently died with a very severe illness and he apparently was suffering a lot, but because of his idea of death, he should have died peacefully, right? Yeah, so exactly. That, that's, that's another example, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You, you have, in fact, uh, lots of uh, examples. They have been gathered by, by a French researcher some years ago in an article, Lucien Jarfagnon, which is an article in French which says uh, the, thousand way, the thousand way of death, uh, of dying of uh, ancient philosophers. So, yes, you're right. There, there are lots of uh, examples, and uh, some of them are dying exactly the way you are expecting they are expected to die and others are like uh, in full contradiction so it's it's a it's a it's a way uh, it's a funny uh, part of the philosophical uh, history of philosophy if i could say mm -hmm. by the way in in what ways did diogenes relate uh, philosophically intellectually of course to some of the other very prominent uh, f Greek philosophers like Socrates and Plato. Did they have something to say about their philosophy or the, uh, their way of doing philosophy or something like that? Yeah, uh, with uh, um, Diogenes, as far as we know, as a kind of uh, um, very critic uh, opinion about Socrates and extremely critic uh, opinion about Plato. Uh, the, the, that uh, he, he was considering Plato that a kind of uh, negation negation of uh, of the principle of uh, philosophy in action. The the main uh, critic Diogenes was uh, uh, doing at uh, uh, Plato and Plato's philosophy that was that he was not living a life of, of philosophy. It was just like producing philosophical ideas, but you couldn't see them in his uh, everyday uh, life. So it wasn't, it was useless. In, in Diogenes point of view, Plato was, uh, was useless. And he says that, he said something like, uh, of what use for us is a man who's been philosophing for uh, so long and has yet not upset uh, anyone. So he was considering him as a kind of a, a lost cause. Someone was producing uh, very high level philosophical ideas, but that we are not grounded. Uh, so um, that was the main uh, critic and about, uh, you know, the idea of the human being, the way uh, Plato defined what is a human being, so meaning a biped uh, with no leaves, uh, with no feathers, sorry, with no feathers. No. Uh, and then uh, uh, Diogenes says a legend, uh, took a rooster, plucked the, the rooster, came to the um, to uh, Plato's gymnasium and said, "This is Plato's human being." Uh, to 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 make fun to the this kind of philosophical corpus. So uh, Diogenes was in that way. He was positioning himself against uh, Plato's school that he considered as a kind of very theoretical philosophy and not a philosophy in action. Mm -hmm. And. Uh... Do we know if Diogenes wrote a lot? Uh, I mean, did he write at all? Uh, as far as we know, he did. He did uh, essays, uh, economic treaties, tragedies too. We have two long lists of his opera. Uh, they are not exactly uh, identical. There are reasons for that, but uh, maybe I won't uh, go so far in the uh, conversation. But but the, uh, we have no reason to, to doubt that he wrote. He wrote, meaning that he must have had some kind of material support, material help. Uh, because you need some scrolls, you need you need to have some material to write in ancient times, like today, I could say. Uh, but yes, he, he wrote, he used writing to develop uh, his ideas, including tragedies, again, theater. Uh, but the thing is, we, we lost everything, basically, apart from a, f a big fragment of his uh, 
um, uh, political philosophy treaty, uh, Politeia, that we we, uh, we 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 which is which been saved by Philodemus of Gadara and quoted. But apart from that, we lost uh, most of his text. So we know his philosophy from uh, his uh, apotechs, uh, aphorism, um, sayings. So the, the the big part of uh, his philosophy, we we grasp it, we get uh, it through uh, anecdotes, uh, meetings, encounters, and the dialogues he had with uh, some people. So some of these uh, sayings are must have been close to the truth, other are very uh, rebuilt by time and uh, dif the different philosophical schools that use them uh, to defend cynicism or to attack cynicism. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to see through this uh, uh, very long and complex transmission process to get to go back to the like original diogenes. Mm -hmm. And which prominent philosophers uh, mention having been influenced by Diogenes? And I'm not just asking about the Greek and Roman philosophers, but basically across history. Um, that, that's, that's a, I'm not sure I am able to fully answer to the to the question, but I to to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. the the um, the philosopher who has been the, maybe the most influenced by uh, Diogenes is will be Emil Cioran the Romanian uh, philosopher uh, from the 19th century right uh, a bit uh, a bit after that he, he died uh, I don't remember exactly when he died I don't know if he died end of the 20th or beginning of the 21st I'm sorry Emil Cioran C -I uh, uh, yeah yeah I know I know who you're talking about I, I I just thought that he was born in the 19th century but Perhaps I'm uh, wrong. Uh, maybe uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I don't think so. I think he is born in the beginning of the twenties. But you, you, oh. you, maybe you know better. Uh, the, the, so, 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 uh, uh, which was a Romanian philosopher, but who he lived in not in exile, but uh, he, he, yes, he lived in cold books in Romanian. Then he changed uh, to uh, to French, and he wrote the rest of his life uh, in um, in French. He lived a very simple uh, life. Uh, basically, with no uh, family, mm -hmm. a very poor life. He didn't work. Uh, he wrote mainly uh, aphorism sayings. So even the way he was communicating philosophy uh, has, some, has something in common with the way we know uh, Diogenes' uh, philosophy. He was very critical with basically uh, everything in the social uh, about social customs, social conventions. So um, a very uh, uh, brutal uh, way of looking at uh, humans and their behavior and society. So um, I would say maybe uh, that the, the, the biggest heir uh, of the 20th century will be Emil Cioran, yes. Mm -hmm. And what about the influence that Diogenes might have had on Stoicism? Did he have an influence there? Yes, yes. Uh, the first influence is uh, genealogic. Uh, the, uh, you know, Socrates had uh, Antisthenes as a pupil. Antisthenes had Diogenes as a pupil, uh, di direct or indirect pupil. We not, we are mm -hmm. not sure of that. Depending, yeah. if Diogenes arrived in Athens before the death of Antisthenes in 366 or after. We are not sure. Mm -hmm. Diogenes had Crates as a pupil and Crates as Zeno and Zeno is the founder of the Stoic uh, school of thought. Um, so there is a genealogic link, that's the first thing. The second thing is there is an ideological link, yes. Uh, Stoics in a way are like uh, civilized cynics, if you could say. Uh, cynic you can be in company with without being insulted. Um, so the, the level of, the, of provocation, transgression, uh, exhortation too is much uh, lower. Mm -hmm. But there, there are some common points. It's a, it's a stoic stoicism is an ethic philosophy as cynicism. Uh, virtue, the search for virtue is key in a stoicism, and uh, there, there is this idea that you you cannot be controlled by your feelings. Uh, uh, the cynics will say that you cannot be controlled by your needs. Stoics will say that you cannot be controlled by your feelings, meaning you cannot be controlled by your by your pain 
or buy your pleasure, which is a common point with uh, uh, cynics. Uh, there is another a strong common point is it is a philosophy in action. Stoics uh, consider that the way you behave is key in a philosophical point of view. Again, it's not a theoretical philosophy. There is a theoretical um, corpus, which is uh, uh, explaining, uh, analyzing the, uh, the idea of virtues, the relationship to feelings, etc. But what is most important is the way you, uh, you behave. And maybe there is a, another element, which is a relationship with uh, nature. For Stoics, um, to understand the, the rules of nature is key to uh, choose your philosophical way of life. You need to stay in contact with the rules of uh, nature. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are there are lots of lots in common. But again, Stoics must have been much easier to um, comp Stoics company must have been much easier, and nicer than Cynics one. Right. And and by the way, actually, I've asked you about Stoicism specifically because we've seen in recent years a resurgence of stoicism in popular culture actually but uh, do you look at this recent resurgence uh, as have an, uh, as having anything to do with the original stoicism yeah i don't know if it's more stoicism or more cynicism the, the this uh, the, the development of the search of uh, frugality autarky um mm -hmm. self-sufficiency um I, I think that some people will will, will uh, claim to be influenced by the cynic model some will claim to be influenced okay. by the stoic uh model i have never made a kind of a full survey of the phenomenon. You're right, I think it's an increasing uh, uh, trend, movement uh, across the world of people who are trying to rethink our relationship to progress and cynics and stoics are of, can be of great help to, uh, to rethink the relationship to, to progress. The idea that we have to accumulate more and more to 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 produce uh, more and more um, some people are trying to live a kind of decreasing uh, life in that uh, perspective and and diogenes is kind of uh, the ultimate model of life in that uh, uh, perspective so yes there is a kind of uh, um, uh, increasing popularity of this uh, ancient philosophic uh, movement, ancient philosophies in actions uh, that are more popular than they've been uh, during, I would say, a century ago, the popularity of this movement was not the same in the, I would, in the population, not in the academic world, but in the uh, normal world, I would say. So, one last question then. How do you look basically at the legacy of Diogenes? I mean, how is he viewed today by philosophers in general and in popular culture? Um, I think there is still some time, um, uh, it's still forgotten sometime. It was forgotten sometime in the ancient uh, uh, time in antiquity. Uh, mm -hmm. so some histories of philosophy, I mean, in the ancient times, uh, uh, forgot. To, uh, to study uh, uh, cynicism, and it still happens sometimes. You have sometimes very large book about ancient philosophy. We don't uh, even credit anything to uh, cynicism. So uh, there is a kind of very old uh, tendency, but uh, things, are, things are changing, uh, I think, in that, in that matter. So there is a kind of uh, rehabilitation of the interest of uh, cynicism because of his genealogy with the Socratic philosophy and the Stoic uh, philosophy, there is a kind of rehabilitation uh, and the, the fact that we are facing this very modern question of uh, and the way uh, the world is uh, going now and the economic, the industrial uh, uh, issues we are, all of us are, are, are facing, uh, it should it should give to uh, cynicism a kind of new uh, uh, new light on. Mm -hmm. 
Great, so uh, the book is again The Dangerous Life and Ideas of Diogenes the Cynic. I'm leaving a link to it in the description of this interview. And uh, Jean-Manuel, just before we go, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you on the internet? Uh, where you can find, you mean if I have some kind of uh, internet? Uh, yeah, like uh, university page, website, social media. I, I have no uh, social media page of any kind. I don't have any <laughs> Facebook page, Instagram page, Twitter <laughs> page, uh, or YouTube channel. Uh, I just have a professional page uh, where my uh, work is uh, uh, referred. Uh, so uh, when I release a new uh, a new study, a new book, uh, you you can uh, find it uh, there. Uh, so that that's it basically. I'm afraid I'm not a, a very electronic uh, person. And do you have, for example, fill a uh, fill people profile or research gate or something like that? Um, I I'm sorry, I did not understand your question. Uh, uh, because yeah. okay. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you so much again for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. It's the same. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. And also, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perergo Larson, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Adam Kessel, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Ruinacio, Zub, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Phil Gavana, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel André, Francis Forti, Agnunes, Fergal Kossen, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, John Linares, Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, John Leira, Tom Hamel, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dan Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevski, Nelek Bak, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Paul Tolentino, John Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litsky, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Lowacki, George Stéphanus, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles de Murray, Alex Shaw, Maury Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dilley Jr., Old Erringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Gracie, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Thomas Dovner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Kimberly Johnson, Benjamin Galbert, Jessica Nowicki, Linda Brandon, Nicholas Carlson, Ismael Benzliman, George Coriatis, Valentin Steinman, Per Crowley, Kate Van Goller, Alexander Hubbard, uh, Liam Dunaway, B.R., Masood Ali Mohammadi, Perpendicular, Jonas Hertner, Ursula Goodenough, Gregory Hastings, David Pinsoff, Sean Nelson, Mike Lavigne, and Dios Necht. A special thanks to my producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Alnick Ortiz and Nick Golden, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadrian, Bogdan Canivets and Rosie. Thank you for all.